For those of you who just join us, very warm welcome to this webinar on stakeholder engagement in district heating and cooling, understanding customers' perspective. I am Pauline Lucas, working within the policy team of Euroheat and Power, the Association for District Heating and Cooling. And this webinar is a joint event brought to you by EHP Congress Virtual Thursdays as well as the Celsius Initiative in partnership with the Reward Heat and the Reuse Heat projects. If you are less familiar with the Celsius Initiative, it is a demand-driven collaboration hub supporting cities in their heat transition to carbon neutrality through efficient and integrated heating and cooling solutions. And this initiative connects its members to exchange experience and knowledge, including through collaborative workshops, uh, the foreigner groups, and we will hear a little more about that uh, later on. Uh, but I would like to uh, start um, uh, with a quote of actually from a recent foreigner group meeting about stakeholder engagement. And the quote goes, uh, stakeholder engagement is about moving from global to local, from project management to human relations. It's about creating bridges. So this statement really reflects the fact that stakeholder engagement is multifaceted and it shows also uh, what is at stake. So going beyond the technological challenges, it's about understanding end users' needs and preferences and getting the buy-in of people that will be affected, uh, for instance, by DHC construction project. It can also help more effectively manage potential risks and deliver quality services. Engagement is often a key success factor to develop or refurbish district energy network. So along this session, we will explore the whom, when, and how to engage with stakeholders to ensure acceptance and trust. And for this, we will have the privilege to hear uh, the insight of our three speakers. So first, uh, Paulius Martinkus, who works as Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer at Vilnius District Heating Company. Uh, Polius is responsible for strategic planning, operational excellence, innovations, project management, and IT development. And Polius holds a Bachelor of Science uh, in Economics and Business from Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, and he is as well a candidate for an executive MBA degree. Then we will hear from Dmitro Romanchenko who works at the, as a, an energy system modeler at the Swedish Environmental Institute, IVL. Dmitro joined IVL in 2020 after he obtained his doctoral degree in engineering at Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. His research, uh, which was based on optimization modeling, uh, focused on the role of buildings and district heating in the transition to sustainable energy system. And uh, last but not least, we will hear from uh, Christian Kaim, project manager at EDF. Christian has dedicated his 15 years long career in the energy sector to the development of district and distributed energy systems for the EDF group. And within his current role, he accompanies the, the planning and commercialization and implementation of cutting edge technology uh, and innovation and services. On this, uh, I will now uh, leave the floor to our first speaker, Polius. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. So um, uh, I would like to shortly introduce maybe the next slide, please. Uh, introduce the, the changes that we are going through in Vilnius District Heating Company. But uh, before going into that, just a very quick intro about Vilnius. So maybe next slide. Uh, so we are integrated district heating company uh, operating only in Vilnius, capital of Lithuania. And um, uh, we are having two, more than 200,000 uh, uh, customers or households that we are serving. We are operator of, uh, of the grid. The total length of our grid is 748 kilometers. And we are um, uh, transmitting 2.7 terawatt hours uh, of 
the heating energy each last year. And uh, we are also operating the production facilities and CHPs. And uh, last year we produced 1.5 terawatt hours. And uh, this is significantly lower than it was transmitted through the grid. And in particular in Lithuania, we have the open competition. So anyone can come and build their own boilers and connect to the, to the grid and sell their heat basically to the grid and uh, then we deliver it to the end customer. And this uh, has a lot of benefits as we are having quite a low price for the electricity heating in Vilnius uh, due to this uh, competition as well as this um, encourages um, the, the shift to the more renewable energy sources. And uh, in 2020, 61% uh, of the total heat that was produced uh, in Vilnius uh, has been uh, produced from renewable energy sources. And it is seven uh, percentage points more compared to the uh, 2019, when it was 54%. And the next two to three years, we should reach 90% from renewable uh, energy sources, so it's uh, we are quite green, let's put it this way, and uh, uh, this reheating uh, area. But this is not enough, uh, and we have more aspirations. So uh, if you could shift another uh, slide, so um, uh, definitely we want to go further and increase um, our uh, efficiency, and we have the aspiration to be. Uh, intelligent energy system that is uh, based on renewable energy sources. And there are five key areas that we want to develop or excel. So um, uh, it's district cooling. We don't have district cooling at the moment in Vilnius, but we plan to introduce it. Uh, then going down with the temperatures on the network. So uh, uh, going to the fourth generation of low temperature district heating networks. This will allow actually to collect the uh, waste heat or residual heat from uh, data centers, shopping malls, and other um, uh, other businesses that are uh, emitting the heat through the, uh, just out to the air. And uh, this uh, lower temperature will also allow to integrate renewable energy sources. And last but not least is definitely smart technologies that we are looking into. So, maybe the next slide. So I will not be able to go through all of those uh, priorities, but um, uh, just I will give a couple of them that are more or less or more related to stakeholder engagement. So the first one is low temperature this reheating network. And if we can click through the, uh, yeah, uh, several times more, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, and yes, so thank you. So uh, so basically low temperature district heating delivers um, efficiency to the uh, district heating uh, companies. And uh, in particular, it allows to decrease the network um, uh, losses, increase the efficiency of the production, in particular the uh, economizers, uh, allows us to connect prosumers who are not only consuming, but also are able to push the excess heat to the, to the grid. Uh, then to collect the residual heat and recuperate it, uh, more efficient seasonal storage, power to heat solutions with the heat pumps, and the integration of renewable energy sources. And um, taking into, into account all these um, efficiency measures, uh, in 2020, beginning of 2020, we started to consider that we should introduce the fourth generation district heating, or basically lowering the temperature to 65 degrees um, uh, on the supply side uh, throughout the year during winter and summer. And we um, identified four locations in Vilnius where we saw new developments, or basically all the new buildings that, that are being built, they are compliant with um, uh, strict regulations on energy efficiency, so 65 supplied. Um, uh, this heating water is sufficient to deliver the heat and uh, provide the hot water. And um, uh, we went to the uh, real estate developers, or basically the key stakeholder in, uh, in this question, as uh, they are uh, selecting the source of, um, uh, of the heating for the house. And uh, it was very 
pleasant to hear that uh, they they took it very uh, positively and they even said that oh it took you so long to to introduce this and we were looking for this uh, uh, for quite some time so uh, so it was quite a positive um, approach and quite an easy work with the uh, stakeholders on shifting to this uh, low temperature district heating so as of uh, last year we started already issuing the uh, terms of connections for the new clients uh, to the low temperature district heating and uh, all those four new areas as well as um, uh, what uh, what we did last year actually it was uh, we participated in the low temperature district uh, uh, heating group discussions initiated by um, Celsius City. We exchanged our, let's say, perceptions, questions, and assumptions uh, with other uh, cities which are already operating the low temperature district heating networks, as well as we got the feedback from various experts. And uh, we decided actually that um, this year, so as of this year, we decided that all the new uh, buildings, as well as the reconstructions of existing buildings, uh, they will be required uh, that they would uh, uh, design their internal systems of, the, of their buildings that would be compliant again with the low temperature district heating uh, network. So basically all the clients that are uh, reconstructing or building new uh, buildings across the network, we are requiring them that their internal system would operate at uh, 60, 40 degrees. Uh, so it means that 65 degrees supplied should be sufficient uh, for those clients to, uh, to deliver the service. So it was, as I said, quite an easy uh, task with the stakeholders as they were looking for this. And uh, it was very great support from Celsius City to avoid various mistakes and to check our assumptions. So if we can go to the next slide. Another topic that uh, we are working on is Intelligent Energy Lab. This is a platform that we have established together with the city municipality. And uh, by establishing this platform, um, uh, we are aiming to connect and invite a lot of uh, various um, uh, market participants, whether it's consultants, uh, transmission, electricity transmission, distribution, production, uh, mobility, uh, various services. So uh, everything that is related uh, to the energy, uh, we are inviting various stakeholders to participate, to give their feedback uh, on where we could excel as a company, uh, where they see the efficiencies or inefficiencies, where it could be uh, improved. So uh, we are opening up our infrastructure for various tests that market participants can come and test their ideas and um, uh, new business models on uh, our production facility or the grid, as well as uh, kind of it opens the mind for us, opens new opportunities and uh, pro provides a glimpse at, uh, at the things we don't know that we don't know. So, uh, so on that side, uh, again, a uh, very interesting initiative. Uh, we have several projects that are already, let's say, initi initiated from this um, uh, platform. Uh, for instance, uh, using the drones to, uh, to measure the, the pollution uh, from our facilities as well as across the city and basically to provide a better view to the uh, to the customers on uh, kind of how green the solutions are of the district heating. So uh, again, involving many different stakeholders to, uh, to innovate and uh, to develop new products, uh, as well as to increase the efficiency of our system, as well as for the, uh, our partners to provide their solutions and ideas. And next slide, please. So those were the two cases, if we can click again through the, uh, through the link. Yes, thank you. So uh, I would uh, like to emphasize the uh, contribution from uh, Celsius City. Uh, it, it was a great actually experience last year. We were uh, spearheading the 
low temperature district heating uh, focus group. And uh, here I would like to emphasize the difference. Today we are having the web seminar where there is more um, uh, one way discussion or basically pre presenting what we have. And uh, uh, while in the discussion groups and focus groups, uh, what, we, what we have is more like uh, peer to peer uh, knowledge exchange as well as uh, involving experts from different fields so that they would uh, share their experiences, uh, possibility to share your case, uh, to set the topics that you would like to tackle and uh, raise various questions that you would like uh, to get more insight. So, uh, and uh, yes, it was great experience last year with the Low Temperature District Heating Network. As I presented today, it was uh, quite a significant push for us, uh, for the company. This year, we are working uh, together with Celsius on district cooling. Uh, this is, again, very interesting topic for us, and hopefully we can do another uh, significant push. Uh, and uh, it's really, really great um, uh, uh, to participate in this uh, program. And uh, just, I guess, uh, I like the philosophy of Celsius City that uh, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. And this is the interesting part of the district heating that we are not com competitors, but more like partners. So exchanging various ideas and various innovations that we have, or we have, or somebody else has, uh, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And for more information, you just uh, you can click on the link or basically follow follow the link. So that's briefly from my side. So uh, uh, and I would like to pass the floor to Dimitro. So thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, yes, so my name is Dmitro Romachenko. I am working at IVL, Swedish Environmental Institute. Um, today, if you click one more time, uh, I would love to present you some of the results from the project, which is called Reward Heat. Uh, before we get back to the next slide, I will briefly introduce the project. So the project is a European project. It focuses on their, or it tries to understand how could we uh, try to replicate or integrate further low temperature and neutral temperature, just heating and cooling. The project spans seven European countries. In the north, this would be Sweden and Denmark. In let's say the middle, it's going to be France, Germany, and Netherlands, and in the south, it's Italy and Croatia. And part of this project was to understand how customers could be uh, uh, could respond to new type of technologies, being low temperature district heating and cooling. So in this project, one of the tasks was to communicate to a number of customers in each of the seven countries. And by customers, we also divided them into two types, which is important to understand now. It's the professional customers, or we call them that. It's the people who actually run buildings or the companies who are in charge of managing buildings and end users. These are the people who actually live in the apartments or in houses. And we collected information that you will uh, see quite shortly by the means of uh, a number of questionnaires that we sent to these people. So just to conclude, the results that you will see are the results of a specific task in a specific project. We do not try to make any comprehensive conclusions, but from another point of view, you actually can see the answers from real people and real companies on the topic, which is replication of low temperature district heating and cooling. So we can click next. And in here, again, I apologize for not having as a professionally made slides as Paulus just presented you. So I'm sorry for this, but I hope I can be as informative as possible. So the first question that we asked people or the first questions to which we tried to draw any conclusions was, which indoor comfort requirements are the most important to the customers? You can see on the figure that we have uh, divided responses to the shares of respondents. So the more people answered 
or chose one of these options, the higher the shares. And you can see that it was only six factors that we included in the questionnaire. And uh, what we can draw as a conclusion that comfortable indoor temperature is the most important indoor requirement is uh, that like 51% of all the respondents answered, meaning that indoor comfortable temperature is indeed the most important factor to the people. We can also see that around 25% of people answer that evenly distributed temperature in all living spaces is important. But again, this factor is related to temperature. So these two together constitute three quarters of all the answers. And from this, I guess it's safe to assume that to people who answered the questionnaire, we could say that indoor temperature is still the most important factor that we can focus on which is a good news for just heating and cooling companies because other factors are less important and then we can have a good leverage on addressing people and customers on how to provide them with this indoor temperatures that they will be satisfied with. An additional comment to the, to the bottom is that during the questionnaires, uh, we found out that in many of these countries or in all of these countries, there are governmental policies or, and regulations that actually put a limit on the minimum indoor temperature. That means that there's a certain degree to which we should heat the houses in order to people feel comfortable. And this minimum uh, level could be from 18, temp from 18 degrees up to 20 degrees, depending on the country and the customer. But the interesting outcome from this project is that in none of the countries, there are regulations on the maximum indoor temperature. And according to what we can see, people are usually uh, would love to have their temperature indoors not more than not more than 23 or 24 degrees. While it is kind of assumed in this country that the temperature up to 28 degrees might be acceptable which is one of the conclusions that we make from this task. And it's probably a uh, food for thought for some of you that in the future, actually maximum indoor temperature will be as crucial to the customers as it is the minimum indoor temperature. We can click next. Okay, yeah, no, thanks. So the second question we were trying to address is the special and temporal flexibility of heating and cooling. By this, we mean to the left, uh, the figure to the left, if we tried to ask people which of the living spaces are less or more important in order to sustain comfortable indoor environment. And to, uh, don't be mistaken, please, the figure to the left asks which of the spaces are less important. So if you can see basement and garages, it's quite obvious that they are less important for people to maintain some stable indoor temperature. But quite interestingly, the people rated bedrooms as not very important of keeping comfortable indoor environment. What was uh, quite ex expected is that kitchen, bathrooms, dining rooms, and living rooms, especially the living rooms, are very, very important for, peeping, for people sorry, to be uh, comfortable and have a nice temperature in. In the figure to the right, we wanted to understand how flexible temporarily this demands, meaning space heating, space cooling, and hot water, to the people. Again, on the y axis, on the y axis, you can see a share of respondents. Don't worry, these numbers should not end up to 100% because people were able to answer uh, multiple choices. But what's important here is that uh, if you look at the figure, we can see that space heating and hot water is not really important during the nights for people. That's quite quite understandable. Uh, we don't really use hot water and we are quite comfortable underneath our blankets. But in the future, during the nights, space cooling can be very important for people. So that's one of other conclusions you can take out from this presentation with you. What also important is that 
Space heating and hot water is kind of expected and most important during the mornings and evenings. But also, it seems like people also grade hot water as equally important throughout the day. Again, pointing to their uh, flexibility in terms of times over the day is that domestic hot water will, is, will probably be important for the people all day long, while space heating will have more flexibility over the day, providing more flexibility to the supply side. So this was the answers to this question. And to the third final slide, if you click. The final question we wanted our customers to answer was, how willing are these people who are answering the questionnaire to pay for greener heating and cooling supply? So as you can see, again, from the figure, we divided it in the shares of respondents. And the main conclusion we can make is that more than we 50% throughout the countries that we uh, distributed the questionnaires in, more than 50% of people are indeed willing to pay more for green heating and cooling. And it's actually even one fifth of the respondents that wouldn't mind to increase their costs by more than 6%. So that's quite the good news, I would say, that we can still have some margin on playing with the cost of heating and cooling and our customers will still be satisfied. Although, yes, it's approximately 40% of respondents, respondents that said that we would rather not pay more or they would even pay less. I guess assuming that renewables and maybe waste heat should contribute to lower prices for heating and cooling. These were the three slides from me. I would probably try to summarize them saying that, okay, the good news is that people are willing to pay for greener heating and cooling. You can probably think of putting more efforts in the future for cooling, and you can still be certain that indoor temperature is very important to people. So we still should be able to be in business with just heating and cooling in the future. We just need to make sure that we do it smart and in communication with the customers. Thank you. That's it for me. I hand over to Christian. Thank you, Dimitro. I will try to share my screen. So I hope you see my presentation. Um, so I said, uh, thank you Dimitri, for uh, passing me the word. So I will present you um, one of the solutions we have developed within the reuse heat project. As the name suggests, um, the project focuses on the system integration of a solution for uh, the recovery of excess or wasted um, in the urban and uh, the urban uh, the urban context. So we are talking about uh, low temperature sources. Um, so this first demonstrator, which I will just introduce you shortly afterwards, um, has been developed uh, mostly by DF with the collaboration of the two partners of the project, uh, Metropolis Côte d'Azur and uh, the Research Center on Building the CSTB. Um, and we also had the great support from our subsidiary Dalkia, uh, which actually enabled us to uh, realize this demonstrator. So this demonstrator is located in the south uh, part of France on the French Riviera. As you might uh, know, we have Marseille and then nearby we have Toulon and the network is located in a, in a small town called La seine sur mer So La seine sur mer is just uh, on the same port area as Toulon and the sea is actually surrounding the whole area and is a very rich source for us uh, for uh, heating and cooling. In this case, um, in the sensor map case, we actually have implemented a system, which is a seawater-based system, in which we are pumping uh, and injecting the water about a four meters depth in the port. Uh, this goes through our first uh, piping system to what we call an exchanger or, uh, or a pumping station, in which we actually ensure that we, have, that we can exchange the calories without exchanging the salt water, which actually would uh, provide many problems for the, uh, for the low temperature loop. So uh, once exiting from uh, point number two, which actually our pumping station is, we have actually cleansed water with the same temperature as the seawater, which in the year varies between 14 and uh, 25 degrees. Um, 
goes to the different substation where actually the energy production is located. So we rise or lower uh, buildings temperatures through heat pumps, uh, heating only, cooling only, or reversible ones. Uh, sometimes we have electric boilers or gas boilers for uh, peak loads. So we have really a big variety of uh, production means located in these different decentralized stations which to serve directly heating and cooling the different customers. And as you might also see on the lower left corner of the picture, we also have a red orange network actually have an island which is operated like a, a low temperature, low to mid temperature heating on the island for a school complex. So, but our real demonstrator is not the infrastructure itself, so the district heating and cooling network. What we are focusing on is dashboard. What we mean for that is a mean uh, to be able to bridge um, the district heating cooling network sector uh, with the, uh, the wider public. So really we want to raise acceptance and awareness uh, of this type of solution among the local wider public because um, we in the France, we are really a special situation which about have just 6% of the total volume of heating in the country is delivered by this type of systems. And personally speaking, through the, all the project we implemented, uh, different uh, uh, questionnaires, uh, stakeholder interviews, end user interviews we've done in past years, we have seen that we really have a big knowledge gap, uh, at least in the country, uh, about this type of system. So far that most people you might inquire in the city, uh, in the streets, they are not aware even this solution exists. So we um, really wanted to find a mean to be able to reach out to the local community and let's say go um, against the fact that the buries, the pipes are buried underground and nobody remembers about them. While we have uh, district heating is one of the best means to realize the energy transition in the Mediterranean area, but in the wider French context, I think also the wider European context. So at the, the project start officially in 2018 uh, and the time in 2017 where we started uh, to make uh, the proposal really were at low TRL. So we had a concept of what we wanted, but we had no real tool which was addressing uh, this type of uh, audience uh, in the right way. So we started from zero and right now we are about at TRL 7. So we have be able to do a prototyping and put it operational. And so be able to have feedback with, uh, let's say, a, a real environment. And we would like to be able to uh, run up to TRL 8, so have really uh, completed and qualified system uh, by the end of the project. How do we achieve that? Actually, we wanted to start from a blank page. Uh, and for this type of services, uh, we choose uh, as very as I think it's one of the most effective for this type of approach, not for all ones, uh, was that to lean on a design thinking approach and go through the whole process uh, thanks to the project. So really started putting stakeholders around the table, uh, doing workshops. Uh, so we put around the table sociologists, designers, uh, district heating network operator, uh, local authority, um, colleagues, practitioners, and also non-practitioners of the, of, the, of the field, and started uh, exploring um, expectations, needs, uh, scenarios, um, and we made many, many assumptions. And we really tried to reach out far and didn't, uh, let's say, deny any solution. And we tried and started to converge into some solution, which actually are focusing mostly uh, on introducing this type of information, the public real, might be, be really public spaces, uh, might be, be in buildings uh, like uh, airport or others, or might be just um, an external, let's say, in a, an internet-based uh, interface which can be accessed uh, from any type of screen or media. So actually, this was the solution we all converged on because we said it's, uh, it's the best minimal viable product, so it's the minimal unit we can build on and then can be expanded and transformed uh, based on, uh, let's say, the learnings we have from um, then the agile iteration we have uh, on based on the prototype we built up. So we build up uh, the first prototype and we run out into, uh, let's say, uh, into the streets and try to get as much feedback as we could from any type of people. And so learn on what the expectations are and what we could improve uh, in a very short cycle 
uh, for this dashboard. And um, while we are testing our assumption, had a lot of surprises. I just wanted to share with you three of them. Uh, first of all, I think was one, it's maybe more technical, maybe related to us, but we wanted to go away from a representation which is linear, uh, which mostly, let's say, um, as is understood for uh, usually centralized and high temperature networks. Uh, we choose to go into something a little bit more complex to explain, but at the same time gives, uh, I think it's explaining better uh, the low temperature type of technologies that we have. And so we move on into circularity and let people understand how we can resource and foster all the different type of interaction within this network. Um, what really was also important to understand is that uh, we don't want to build an open source platform for data. We want to, through data, uh, bring an, an enriched other type of information, other type of, uh, of, of uh, contact content, be able to let people understand how the, things, how the system works and uh, by themselves explore uh, the system and look to the data and try to make sense out of them. So for us, it's really important to understand we cannot just show them uh, graphs and curves. Uh, we should really contextualize the data. So we integrated the data into uh, illustration and schemes which enable people to visually just start to explore the hot side or the cold side of the exchanger of the, or the heat pumps, uh, look to the seawater temperatures just by clicking uh, visually on the things so they already know what they're looking at and can more, uh, let's say, um, easily uh, understand uh, the information, the content you're putting to them, uh, we are showing them. And then we really, uh, one of the biggest challenges was that we had to really step back in expectation in terms of language, in terms of understanding. Um, Uh, with videos, explanations, because we have seen that all, almost all terminology we use uh, in our daily business uh, is not unknowledgeable by the wider public. And we came out, out also with some new terms like recycling. So uh, even the term of waste and excess, it was really far away from the sensibility of the people. So we got from them the feedback should be easier if you told them uh, we say you recycle energy and then explain what it is because that is more relating to us and it's near to our reality. So we really had a rich, 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 um, rich return um, just in this third iteration. And now we are going into the last, um, in the last phases, which actually to measure uh, the feedback from, uh, from our dashboard and to learn for that. So thanks to the project of Reuse It, we have been able to move uh, from an idea to uh, a finished product. So we are right now on the starting blocks to disseminate. So um, we're waiting for, uh, uh, let's say, um, making every single left box we have right and be able to go uh, uh, public with the, with the dashboard and spread the voice about it because we need feedback uh, from wherever. We are mostly focused on the French context, but uh, feedback from the European community might uh, be very, very important for us also. Uh, so through that, we want to validate uh, our dashboard for that we provided, um, we already prepared an online survey. And we also going on site to uh, interview our customers uh, on site to be able to have a much more a richer dialogue with them. And so have a more qualitative assessment than what we get as quantitative from the survey, hopefully. And this also brings us to, let's say our main objective is actually the replication to scale and replicate this type of solution. Uh, we're working on that, but for that, for that first, we need to um, get more feedback from the community and get more, some more learnings and see what we could better to better adapt uh, the solution and scale it and replicate it. So thank you very much. That was all for me. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, uh, Paulius and Dimitro, for your interesting presentation. Maybe we can all come back uh, with our camera on to, to kickstart uh, the conversation um, between us and the audience. Um, I would like to invite the audience to, to use the, the Q&A box uh, to, to ask any question, but maybe uh, then I, I will kickstart uh, the discussion uh, as we don't have many uh, yet. Uh, so 
at, at European level, we're talking about uh, increased climate and decarbonization ambition. And we know that uh, the, the, the customer will be key in that uh, food choices, for instance. And we also seen through some polls and, and surveys that um, there is a clear interest in, in green district heating as also Dmitry has shown. Um, so uh, my question is then uh, how to encourage consumer to, to contribute to system efficiency and, and flexibility. So we already have had an example through, through the dashboard and such initiative, but what would be the key enablers or tools to, to support this uh, engagement of the end user? And this question is, uh, is addressed to all of you, so feel free to, to take the floor. First volunteer to, to break the ice. Yeah, I, I can comment maybe just uh, as the district heating company, there are several kind of challenges that we see or basically that uh, the customer could contribute more. At least in Lithuania and in different countries, there are different kind of legislation set up. But um, uh, we as the district heating operator, we are not allowed to operate uh, uh, the substations. And substation is one of the key uh, kind of element of the system if you want to reach the, uh, the efficiency. So for us, uh, it, it is one of the uh, topics where uh, uh, we try to kind of uh, communicate to our end customers that, look, you have to watch after the substation if you want to increase the general efficiency, which would come back with the lower prices is basically it's regulated. So the regulator is basically shifting the end uh, kind of uh, savings to the, to the end customer. So, so I would say this is one, one of the things. Another thing is basically what we also see, even despite uh, kind of those low temperature district heating and uh, we try to kind of uh, involve real estate developers, uh, what we see that there are still some cases of uh, economic housing or basically a cheap uh, real estate development uh, where they would still favor the, the gas gas boilers. So uh, so on, on that side, it is again the, the awareness of, of the customer. Actually, what we see from the experience that it might be a, a bit cheaper on the capital in, investment but uh, at the end of the day the the opex in, uh, kind of operating expenses are really higher for the uh, for the final customer and we have already cases where the customers are overpaying for later on maintenance of the kind of gas boilers and all those things so so it's again a lot of communication with the with the customer so that the customer maybe it, it sounds a bit too too technical or too complicated but uh, but basically engage, engaging the end customer into this. And definitely another, all, all other things that come with the new technologies of those prosuming and uh, collecting the residual heat. So again, talking with the uh, shopping malls, uh, that they could feed in the uh, excess heat uh, to the grid instead of uh, uh, letting it out through the cooling towers and, uh, or data centers. Yes, it might be additional investments and yes, it might be some maybe additional risks for the internal system, but, uh, but definitely looking again system-wide or uh, more global picture, then, uh, then definitely it provides the, the possibilities to go for this decarbonization uh, efforts and more efficiency. Thank you, Paulius. Yes, yes, go ahead, Christian. Yeah, no, just to answer maybe from our point of view, I think there's a difference if we address B2B customers, so business customers, or uh, let's say the end user, which sometimes are always interfaced by the building operator. So too often the district heating network operation business is a B2B to C uh, type of relation. And so the customer really comes at the end and that is what we actually would like to bridge with our dashboard is a little bit there that we have seen that well, it's been a contradictory situation in which we sometimes want to make uh, end user participate through contractual relations, uh, through incentive, monetary incentives, uh, which usually go towards a kind of complexification of contracts, uh, reselling contracts, uh, which I think is not 
we see that it's not really the right way because people want easy contracts. Customers don't have yet so much knowledge, so much sensibility to bear the burden to have complex type of contracts with different tariffs and dynamic type of things because they have other stuff to think about in the daily lives than that, easily said. Um, so what we wanted to try to, and what we want to test actually is this dashboard is to try to light a little bit of soft power. So going through the sense of community, going through the sense of being part of a local uh, community, being part of a district, being part of a building. And so try to so the sense of, of, of being part of something, uh, maybe be at some point, we're not there yet with the dashboard, it's not the objective in the short term, but in the long term, maybe be able through this type of means to foster this creation of dialogue about the solution among the community, uh, and maybe through other means, be able to, to foster this type of, uh, let's say, uh, discussions and creation of, of knowledge, awareness, and sense about what's, what's happening in our surroundings. Yeah, I guess I have a very short comment on compliment both Paulus and Christian. And just taking a perspective as a final end user of people, yeah, I would kind of agree completely with Christian. It's we still don't know how much the customers would want to be engaged. And if they want, I mean, what is the threshold? I mean, we need to identify how much money they can save to pay off for their engagement. Because right now it seems like we have a lot of efforts on engaging them, but we don't know will it be even used by the end customers at the end. I mean, they can install all the software and they can have all the contacts, but they will not, they will never act on it. So maybe the question is, we don't even really need the engagement. We just need their agreeableness to just, okay, in some rooms you can change my temperature indoors when you need, and then the company will make a decision. So I, I guess it's a bit more straightforward conclusion, but we just need more demo sites and more projects to really understand in which countries and in which circumstances people need to be, the final customer needs to be engaged, or maybe that's not required at all. I, I have a question actually for you, Dimitro. Um, in the study, it is mentioned that uh, the next generation district heating solution have competitive advantage uh, compared to um, other heating solution in being able to, to match uh, the customer uh, comfort requirements more closely. So I think it's a very important aspect and also perhaps a very determinant uh, advantage of, of district heating. Um, so would you would you care to, to comment and develop a little bit on that or uh, actually it can it can be also the, the other uh, speakers? I mean uh, sure um, obviously we need to all understand that there are some individual solutions that can also have very good competitive uh, features to district heating and cooling. But one of the things that uh, low temperature district heating and cooling can be very competitive is that, it's very competitive with, for example, floor heating. Uh, from another point of view, I mean, if you have control and we have smart heating, we can actually make heating in different rooms and have different set temperatures without a person going into each room and increasing the temperature or decreasing. So, and probably this heating also have this advantage of just relieving people from this control. I mean, we, we still don't know how much of the control they need. Although they can complain, or not complain, they can claim that they want more control, but that's not really uh, true, probably. So yeah, the competitiveness and the advantages are, yeah, the floor heating, the different temperatures in different rooms. I mean, these are all examples, but yeah, we, we can maybe my colleagues will help me out with naming even more advantages. We also have a question from the audience for Christian. Um, so it's from uh, John O'Shea from, from Kodima, Dublin. Um, for, uh, with your seawater solution, what important stakeholders did you have to engage with uh, from an environmental impact uh, point of view? And what sort of information did they require? For instance, uh, water extraction, rate, extraction rates, temperature changes, et cetera. Did any of this engagement change your design? 
thanks for the question. Indeed, yes, it's a main point for us. Um, as you might expect, it's the seawater, it's the sea, it's a port, so it's very, very fragile environment. And so actually this is very well, um, let's say, constrained, uh, defined in the French regulation. So from an environmental point of view, uh, you have to not to do any special type of permitting or complex one. Uh, if you are able to ensure that your temperature, reject temperature from the network stays below 25 degrees, because that respects more or less your maximum temperature degree in summer uh, on the Mediterranean Sea, which is around 25 degrees. So you have no direct impact on the water. So your main problem is summer. The problem is not the winter time because you're heating up uh, relatively lowly the water, but in summertime you are contributing and heating up even more the water because you're extracting the heat physically from the building. So you might imagine might have an impact. Uh, so for that we had to go through and we have to do that for all our um, seawater based system is to make an amendment uh, based on an environmental study, depending on the uh, on the request. Uh, from the authority it might be more or less uh, deep and precise, but we have to prove that we can rise the temperature to 30 degrees and we can dissipate uh, in a way that it will not impact flora and fauna. Uh, so well, once this is assessed, our constraint is to be stay below 30 degrees um, water rejection. Uh, in our case, in our sense, your mayor, uh, this is under control, let's say, with the system in place and with the substation we have. Um, you might imagine if going to much more uh, extreme situation, we have too much base uh, load imbalances. We will also have to foresee to cool down the network in summer, uh, then with more or less sustainable means. Um, so, well, uh, that's what you have to, um, to put around. Uh, I said which stakeholders we have to put around the table. Well, we have the environmental institutes, we have the local authority, and in our case, we were juggling between uh, the municipal authority and the metropolitan authority uh, because they were just transposing um, the, uh, the competence about district heating cooling networks to the metropolitan authority. Uh, but that's more or less what you need in presence. And if you are uh, in a case of a port, which is operated by a dedicated delegation of service. Well, that's also one of the partners you have surely to ensure to put around the table. Uh, and in this case, we have no uh, shipping, big shipping um, maneuvers. So we don't have a big issue about influencing the maneuverability of these vessels. But if we are in a port area where we have uh, ferries or any type of vessel um, in the canal, we have to ensure and make studies that we, our rejection and the water flow that's created, the stream is created, will not influence the maneuverability of the vessels. So that is one point we have to keep in mind if you are in a port area, there's a lot of activities. And well, and I said, it's four meter depth. So from engineering part, it's not that complex. We are not talking about piping going down one kilometer into the water. Uh, actually, this brings me to ask you, um, did you notice or acknowledge any barriers um, in your in your communication with these different stakeholders? This might be for, for Polius or for Christian, I, I, I guess. And uh, how did you overcome that? And is there, uh, maybe that's more for Polius, any kind of formal structure in, in place for um, engagement and, and cooperation as your uh, transformation towards four genera fourth generation is, is uh, incremental uh, in terms of timing? Actually, we, we, we don't have any kind of formal procedure that would be kind of set into the, some kind of document. It is more kind of uh, trying to foresee what could be the questions. And we organized the conference with, uh, as I said, real estate developers, and it was very well received. Uh, they, they are looking for innovative solutions, and they were even themselves uh, kind of proposing some new ideas. So on that side, I, I would say that it's kind, kind of quite, quite positively uh, perceived, as well as uh, various uh, residual heat or waste heat recuperation. We see also from the clients that uh, they are willing to kind of to analyze. They are not sure whether there will be any costs or 
some of them quite old, but uh, I, I would say it's very constructive and usually we try to approach the customer and provide the idea and uh, to show the picture what are the opportunities. So, uh, so we have quite a good relationship. It's, it's more, I, I would say we, we had uh, one case where, um, as I said, one real estate developer, which was very cost cautious. And uh, they said that they, they have their own segment and uh, yeah, they, they don't want this, but, uh, but then basically yeah, they, they have to go uh, to choose uh, other alternatives as basically we see as this will not be sustainable. And they are programming the problem for their future customer, and that's it. May I add something? Yeah. Um, I mean, as obstacle, we just we go talking about uh, what we usually see. Maybe stakeholders from different type, maybe public, but also private. I mean, business customers, operators, building operators, or promoters, real estate developers. Is that in our context, this type of solution uh, very well unknown? So uh, sometimes we see that we have an ensure our customer that the solution is viable, it works, it makes no noise, uh, it doesn't stink, uh, it makes no pollution, uh, it's not visible, um, so it doesn't have visual impact, and so on and so forth. And when we are able to show them that this works, for example, if talking about a recuperation of sewage water, a sewage water plant, you have to assure them all these, let's say, factors, which for us are technically speaking, manageable and clear that there's no issue but I mean for the wider public these things they they don't understand it and so we have to reassure them on all these things and uh, I think that's one obstacle we have usually to overcome but that can be easily overcome if you have installation which is running and you could show them bring in there and then they will be reassured Okay, I, I see it's, uh, it's 11, uh, so time flies. Uh, I would like to, to conclude this session saying that, uh, well, stakeholder engagement is a, is a work in progress and uh, we will probably continue this, uh, this discussion uh, in, the, in the coming years. Um, so I would like to thank uh, the speakers for their insights and also thank uh, the audience for joining us today.